Welcome to The Brand Called You. The brand today is Anurag Harsh, who's the Group Chief Data Officer at Holsim. Prior to that, he was the Chief Marketing and Digital Officer at Amelia, which is an IP soft company and a leading company in the artificial intelligence space. He's held several leading roles as the digital or data officer at companies like IDG, CBS, CNN, uh, and uh, spent several years as senior vice president at Ziff Davis. He's got an MBA from MIT, as well as a master's from Wharton. And he also studied at the University of Sheffield for computer science. Welcome to the show, Anurag. Thank you for having me, Sandeep. So my first question is about your current role at Holsim, which I know is a, is, a, is a big company, but maybe not as well known among uh, retail investors or, or common people. Can you tell us what do you guys do? Well, thank you for the opportunity to come and talk to you, Sandeep. You know, Holsim, previously known as Lafarge Holsim, uh, is the world's largest building materials and infrastructure solutions company. Uh, we are roughly about 30 billion in net revenue. Um, the name Holsim was derived from Holder Bank Cement, um, Holder Bank Cement Holsim. Um, and Holder Bank is a municipality in the district of Lenzburg uh, in the canton of Arau, about 45 minutes west of Zurich in Switzerland. And so that's where our global headquarters are also in that region in Switzerland and Zug. Uh, we have about 20,000 operating sites. Uh, these are cement plants, concrete facilities, terminals, et cetera. And over 2,200 of them are actual plants uh, with a presence in over 70 countries, uh, including the largest building materials company here in the United States, as well as in India, where we are in the market in India as ACC and Ambuja. Uh, wholly owned subsidiaries. So we produce building materials like cement, concrete, aggregates, and highly specialized smart building solutions and products uh, for modern infrastructure developments. People don't realize is that you know concrete is the most used substance um, on the planet after water. And so you know we've been involved in some of the largest and most renowned infrastructure projects globally, including you know the World Trade Center, the new World Trade Center here in New York. Uh, and the new Paris, uh, Grand Paris Underground, uh, which is actually the largest construction project in all of Europe ever. Uh, and what we're trying to do is solve the challenge uh, that people face around the world, you know, whether they're building individual homes or major infrastructure projects, a lot of the demand for our materials and our solutions is really driven by global population growth, uh, urbanization, you know, improving living standards, sustainable construction, et cetera. So our goal really is to move the 2 billion or so people on earth who are moving into the fabric of society with housing, schools, bridges, roads, banks, tunnels, you know, daily living infrastructure over the next two decades where 60% of the infrastructure to support them has not really been built yet. So we're building greener cities from foundation to rooftop involved in green mobility, we're bringing wind energy down to earth, you know, those kinds of things, 3D printing, and really are paving the way to truly circular concrete uh, with recarbonation. So that's what Wholesome is. That makes it a little bit more tangible uh, with the brand names like uh, ACC and Ambuja, which I think everybody has heard of, and, and um, that gives it context, but it's a huge company, uh, 30 billion in revenue. Yeah. And it's about as brick and mortar a description of company as one could expect. What does right. a chief data officer do at something that uh, seems so tangible, so physical? Yeah, so you know, my office is really actively investing in advanced analytics, machine learning, and AI initiatives to drive impact in reducing the planet's carbon footprint. Um, we, as an industry in the building materials construction industry, roughly 8% of the overall planet's carbon footprint. So what we do is I work on the manufacturing industry's most challenging use cases in production, supply chain, logistics, distribution, and optimizing our commercial operations across our 2,000 plus plants in 70 countries. So 
we have a lot of data and analytics initiatives underway, a lot of optimization initiatives underway uh, within quality, predict, uh, you know, predictive asset maintenance, energy management, CO2 emissions. So for example, you know, we're doing strength prediction modeling, things like that, automated operator recommendations, closed and open loop process control optimization, you know, new high value predictive models impacting the quality of the product, which we call as finesse. Uh, we're doing a lot of work with predictive asset maintenance is almost um, a fifth of the overall um, um, cost in Europe, for example, uh, where we're doing predictive modeling for the failure of critical installations ahead of time, where we kind of know if something is about to break or not. I mean, a gearbox, for example, in a cement plant is $2 million. And typically, you know, we'll, we'll have to shut down the plants for three weeks every year just to do maintenance. Uh, while there's no production happening. So if you can forecast that ahead of time, that's, that's obviously a lot of value. That's where a lot of data come in. So process recommendations to increase the lifespan of critical installations, which is really the span time in between plant shutdowns, doing a lot of work with energy management. Um, you know, I've got a full energy team looking at integrated fuels, you know, milling energy, spend management with energy price prediction models. We're looking at logistic and ready mix concrete energy optimization. I mean, I personally am very involved with overall global energy stewardship, looking at integrated fuels, fineness, milling, cogeneration optimization. And we also do a lot of work with over, overall CO2 emissions. Um, you know, we work very closely with governments around the world. And a lot of what I do is, you know, things like agile fuel, CO2 optimization, looking at CO2 optimized cement types, ready mix formulations, fossil fuel reduced cement, you know, things like that. So there are a lot of different you know, things that we're involved in, but in general, if we were to break it down, you know, it's within manufacturing, distribution, supply chain, logistics. In manufacturing, you know, we've got an initiative called the Plants of Tomorrow where we're using a lot of data and analytics to, for example, predict new project demand. You know, where is new construction happening around the world? And you know, most of this is localized, but it's global as well. We're looking at overall supply network optimization through the improved association of quarries and plants, doing uh, analytics around stock optimization, RFID tracing of raw materials, or early emissions of leaks and errors via automated drone monitoring. We're looking at augmented reality for the visual inspection of equipment and faster maintenance interventions. Uh, I already talked to you about predictive maintenance. We're looking at exoskeletons for increased operator safety. We're looking at digital twin technologies for the production process, creating an end-to-end -end transparent supply chain connections. We're looking at improved replenishment through connected I, machinery. Um, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but if I were to, it seems like that even though it's a very physical product, cement is as physical as it gets, uh, there are obviously lots of business processes in terms of how it is uh, manufactured, equipment monitoring, quality assurance, how is it distributed, demand estimations, uh, which are, again, uh, processes where a digital or a database predictive uh, model could help. And, and seems like that's a big part of what you do. I have two questions. One, has that changed? Is this like a new position in a firm like Holsim where this has become a much bigger focus in the last few years? Or has it been going on? Because I, I don't think people realize that how important data is becoming even in very physical kind of industry. So that's one question. Is it recent? How would you categorize the journey? And then I will come to more of the core of cement, as you said, on the climate side, but we'll touch that later. Why don't we go on the first one first? Yeah, sure. So, you know, to be honest, like most companies, not only in the manufacturing sector, but in any sector, data has kind of become the new buzzword, as we all know. And data science has become, and this is, you know, if you actually look, look for data scientists, for example, you know, you're, you're getting a lot of people who previously used to be what we call as BI guys or, you know, just good old analysts who sort of moved into data science and sort of upgraded their skills. So the overall experience is, let's say, eight years or so. And so the industry in data science and advanced analytics, um, from that perspective, machine learning and AI has only been about eight or 10 years old. So in some ways, yeah, this is a new position. And in companies like, you know, Wholesome or other sort of very traditional Manufacturing companies, even in the oil and gas sector, for example, in Shell or Texaco or, uh, or any of those kinds of companies, 
you know, these positions are have, have been around for no more than four or five years in, in many cases. And so, and it's only now that, you know, people are looking at Facebook and Google and Amazon and those kinds of companies and saying, hey, data and advanced analytics and machine learning and things like that have made a strategic and, and material impact um, to the bottom line of these companies. And so we, maybe we should be looking at these kinds of things as well. And so I think that's where the board and the governance of, um, large manufacturing companies and, and large sort of traditional industries have really started to think about it. Now they're, um, you know, they're obviously recruiting a lot of board members who have experience with this sort of thing and then can actually become um, supporters of it. So yeah, my position, I've been with them for about just over two years. Um, I was consulting with them prior to that a little bit, but um, most of these kinds of positions have been around for a shorter period of time. Yeah. Very interesting, but it is starting to make impact and it is starting to have a voice at the board and the C-level suite. So that is yeah, interesting thing to hear. Coming to the part that you touched on, which is the core of cement, you know, at the, at the I was reading the Bill Gates uh, book on climate change and he has a whole chapter dedicated to cement and he points out the, uh, which is obvious, but I didn't realize that in the core of how limestone and, you know, the the process of making the cement itself really releases carbon dioxide. And there isn't much that can be done about that part of making cement as, as, a, as a compound and as a, as a material. How is that going to get addressed, do you think, over uh, to achieve the net zero emission goal by 2050? We're still gonna be consuming a lot of cement, presumably, uh, but mm -hmm. how do we get to net zero uh, in this area? So there's a lot of work that's already underway. I mean, if you just, you know, um, talked about the Gates Foundation report, um, in the report it also says the world emits about 33 billion metric tons of CO2 into the atmosphere every year. And the building materials in the cement industry, the concrete industry, the construction is about 8% of this number. So it's a very large number. And so every little bit that we do um, obviously makes an impact um, one concrete facility at a time, because with, you know, in our case, 20,000 installs, it's certainly the numbers start to add up. And so we have pledged, you know, to net zero, and we are spearheading the transition towards low carbon construction from alternate fuels to concrete recycling. So it's not just in the production of cement, but there's a whole variety of other things. Now, in general, one ton of cement produces about 1.25 tons of carbon dioxide. Now, this cement is produced in these very large capital intensive production plants that are generally located near limestone quarries or other mineral resources. And these sources are the principal raw materials used in the process, in the manufacturing process, because the production plants are very expensive. They're about a billion dollars a plant. And so the CO2 that is emitted as a byproduct of the clinker production, clinker, by the way, is an intermediate product in the manufacturing process in which the calcium carbonate gets calcinated and converted into lime, which is CAO, which is the primary component of cement and CO2 is also emitted during the production by fossil fuel combustion. So we are actively working on reducing these emissions. You know, we've signed the one and a half degree Celsius pledge, SBTI, which is science-based intermediate targets uh, and in alignment with the net zero pathway from shaping, we have this whole thing called the plants of tomorrow with automation and artificial intelligence to accelerate green solutions. And I'll give you two examples of something where it's really made a lot of difference. The first is in Georgetown University uh, we're actually, there's two construction projects going on right now in the United States, in the Northeast. One is Georgetown. It's a 12 story student residence in the heart of Washington, DC. And the other one is Boston University's uh, 19 story computing and data science center. Uh, and in Boston and Washington, DC, as you know, these cities have pledged to be carbon neutral by 2050. Both the buildings use a special form of cement that we manufacture is actually a concrete called EcoPack, uh, which is our low carbon concrete. And our Georgetown we also have a solutions division, which has come up with other features like solar panels, rainwater collection systems, and many other environmentally conscious features, the combination of which achieved an emissions reduction that was the equivalent of removing 1 million miles of road travel by fossil fuel cars. In Boston, you know, the green concrete uh, were actually, it's the largest four Boston has ever seen. And that building is gonna complete in 2022. We are a key partner in that. Uh, we've provided all of the material and the results are incredible. More than 700 tons of CO2 were saved. That's the equivalent of taking some 140 cars off the street for a whole year. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on. And, you know, we're, we're driving a lot of this kind of circular construction 
in metros and tunnels. There's a lot of transport infrastructure projects, you know, where we actively recycle construction and demolition waste to keep the materials in use as long as possible. So for example, we see recycled materials using the new Grand Paris Express underground into low carbon concrete and then and aggregates for use in the roads. And we did the same with Switzerland's Gotthard Tunnel, which is, uh, uh, which is the, the longest and deepest tunnel in the world. And we're doing very similar things is using complex set of data to, to, to design like smarter roads, you know, to create the greenest mm -hmm. possible solution. So there's a lot of you know, effort underway. Yeah. We're looking at local resources, expected traffic, what is a project lifespan, looking at weather downloads uh, data, and that allows us to build like earthquake resistant roads in California or even monsoon resistant roads in Meghalaya in India. So there's a lot of you know, eco-friendly cement, that kind of effort that's underway. We're one of the leaders in that, but it's not just the product itself, Sandeep. I think it's a lot of, you know, uh, it's also renewable the energy, energy consumed in know. it and the process yeah. around. Like, you know, we'll do okay. a lot of wind wind farming and that sort of stuff, you know, solar and sure. things like that. Sure. So, yeah. Sure. Thank you. Um, well, you've been a digital pioneer uh, and a leader at AI and media companies. Um, what, and I know you are a very active voice on LinkedIn. I, you were rated as the number one technology uh, voice on, on LinkedIn as well. What surprises you uh, as you watch sea level struggle uh, with digital journeys in the last five to 10 years? You know, what, what do you scratch your head and say, why don't people get this yet? I think, you know, with large companies, I think smaller companies, it's a lesser of a struggle in somewhat because, you know, they don't have a scalable a scalability problem. Large companies are a little different. You know, what I've actually seen, and this is a pattern that I've seen in lots of large companies, which is they're in the dungeon of pilots, you know, proof of concepts, where they do a lot of these little pilots and they will download a bunch of data offline, do a proof of concepts, kind of prove the point a little bit, but never get to the, what we call as an MVP, which is most viable product stage or get to a production environment. And then beyond that, how do you actually scale it to be able to realize value? And I think that what is going on is it's becoming a change management issue fundamentally. So for every dollar that is invested in technology, one dollar equal dollar has to be invested in change management, in the governance and the business side of things, in adoption of that technology to make sure the values realize. And that's kind of where a lot of the companies are, are, uh, are not doing it. They're, they're, they're becoming very technology centric. They think is technology gonna solve the problem, but what people are not realizing in very large companies, even in banking, which in many cases is a very traditional, you know, with ask any CI of a bank, you know, how archaic and legacy systems the technologies are. And so technology is not gonna be able to just, you know, sort of drive all of that. There has to be human adoption and that's a psychology issue. That's a change issue. People generally don't like to change. They think that, hey, we're the world's largest building materials company. We've got the largest quarries in the world. You know, we're gonna make, we're gonna be just fine even without all of this. So I think that mentality needs to be changed and it takes a lot of time, almost generations before that happens. So you can do all of the digital, but oftentimes they all fail a lot of the times. And that's a pattern I've seen. So it's about change yeah. management. It's about changing people's minds. Yeah, and and that is why companies still get disrupted every every few years, where a new company will come in and totally disrupt the largest players. You know, we've right. seen that in, for example, automobile. Tesla has come in and established a totally new paradigm in many areas. Sure. Uh, well, let's change gears. Go to more of a personal side of your journey. Tell us about your childhood. Where did you grow up? What were a couple of your major influence in early childhood that shaped your life? Uh, thank you. Um, I grew up in Jamshedpur. I was born in Srinagar and Kashmir. Um, and uh, when I was young, you know, my, my parents moved to Jamshedpur. My father was a Tata guy and, you know, he was a, eventually a retired senior executive in Tata Steel. So I'm a Tata boy. I grew up in Jamshedpur uh, and amongst uh, a lot of engineers and uh, we call them a lot of IIT types because pretty much everybody uh, who was you know, working with my father, including my father was a graduate trainee from one of the IITs and, you know, all of their kids went to IITs. And so that sort of was my environment uh, for many, many years in Jamshedpur. Uh, you know, it was a very sort of, 
small cocoon club life where mm. you would, you know, I grew up playing tennis mm. and uh, doing a lot of singing, a lot of swimming. So in many ways, it's not your very typical, uh, you know, large, large city life in India uh, or even a small town life in India. It's sort of, uh, it, was, it was a very nice, uh, eclectic upbringing. Um, and music was a very big part of that life. Um, and so, you know, from a very early age, uh, my mother was a singer. My father was also dabbling in music a lot. And so it was an integral part of my life. We had music playing in, in classical music pretty much, you know, all the time in our house that we were not sleeping. And so that kind of like essentially uh, became a part of my being as I was growing up. And then when I was very young, about 14, um, I got a Duke of Edinburgh scholarship. Uh, to uh, go to England. Um, it was uh, basically part of the British Council, which is ex-Commonwealth scholarship. And, and so few of us got selected from India. We ended up in England. I ended up at the University of Sheffield, which was also the alma mater of Dr. J.J. Irani, who at the time was the uh, managing director of Tata Steel. Um, and so I ended up doing computer science over there. It's funny that I work in artificial intelligence and machine learning now, because at the time I was registered for cognitive science, which in 1990, early 1990, 91, was really sort of just upcoming. And everybody pretty much said, what are you doing? Why are you studying cognitive science? Nobody knows what this is and, and all of that kind of stuff. So I actually ended up moving to computer science. Um, but you know, that's what I did for a while. And you know, then I worked and I became a part-time job. I did a broadcaster at the BBC and um, and then eventually ended up uh, in in the United States, uh, like uh, a lot of a lot of people at that time, um, because the opportunities in the United States were uh, were better than they were in Britain at the time. Um, and then um, you know ended up going to MIT and then to Wharton and studying and you know just uh, kind of uh, working like everybody else over here and and working my way up. Yeah. Yeah. A uh, fascinating combination of uh, engineering and music. Those are the two things you've picked up. Uh, and, um, and, and, and did you get that from your father and mother? But you said your father also was a singer. So he also had both sides to him. Um, yeah. That uh, left side, right side of the brain combination of being an engineer and an artist um, is fairly unique. I know you are an accomplished singer, classical singer, and have performed at uh, venues like Carnegie Hall. Um, how, how does that still shape you? Does that, is, that, is that two separate parts, or do you see something that brings it together in you in a way that, um, that uh, is different? Yeah, this I mean, that's the that's... engineering journey and the musical journey. Yeah, no, that's a great question, and uh, Sandeep. You know, for me personally, always been a little bit of a struggle um, uh, dealing with it here in the West, uh, where in India, it was a little easier. Um, there are a lot of people like me in India because culturally it's just very different over there. Um, there were a lot of people in senior management who are also great sitaris, Buddha Dev Das Gupta, et cetera, Mukherjee. And, and so it's not unusual uh, to find a sort of left brain, right brain in, in India. In the United States, I think um, it's been a little different. Um, you know, I have had to kind of um, table, you know, that side a little bit um, and I keep them very separate. And it's not just me, everybody who has these skills on let's say the musical side, you know, I've got several friends who are great. Uh, they live in New Jersey, for example, the great harmonium player. Uh, and they would, uh, they would also do the same thing, which is they'd had a completely different side where on Thursday or Friday, they would do a bunch of concerts and go there. And then, you know, the, there's no video that actually gets done. And then, you right. know, it kind mm -hmm. of like just finishes there. So that was my life for a long time. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, you know, there are a few of us who have very, 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 very developed left and right brains. And um, I can switch between one of the two completely uh, and be relate and be able to relate to uh, mm -hmm. a very sort of arty, musical um, audience or uh, friends in a very different way that I can when I'm, I'm, when I'm talking about um, data and analytics or business in general. Um, 
And it's difficult, you know, that's a, that's more sort of an emotional side of you. And this is more sort of a left brain side of you. And you just have to balance it in the workplace a little bit. You know, I'll have colleagues who would sometimes Google me and they'll come up with this video of the Carnegie Hall concert where they're actually quite flabbergasted because um, they're like, the first thing that's like, you know, dude, you got 2 million views in that. And I'm like, well, okay. So it's just, you know, what they're looking at. And they're like, we, we couldn't have imagined that you were performing like that. So I think, um, I don't know how they process it. Um, I mean, I don't necessarily hide it or anything, but yeah, I mean, it's a side of me um, and I, I manage it uh, in whichever way I possibly can. And I perform every now and then. And, you know, it's been, you know, it's kept me very grounded for most of my life and I'm able to deal with the, the stresses of corporate life because of it. Yeah, I would urge everyone to Google and 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 hear that it is quite uh, spellbinding and seeing the power of that singing. I don't know if if you can do something in a very short time and give us a a small piece. Or I, I know we don't have a lot of time. If it's even possible, right. um, you know, I was thinking maybe in the interest of time and something that um, everybody knows. You know, if an audience, um, like I can sing the Indian national anthem in a slightly more classical way. Um, mm, mm, Punjab Sindh Gujarat Maratha Dravid Utkal Banga Vindhya Himachal Yamuna Ganga Uchal Jaladhitaranga भारत भाग्य विधाता जय है जय है जय है जय 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 है Thank you so much, Anurag. That it really gives me um, great pleasure uh, to hear you sing. And uh, again, the link to that uh, um, your Carnegie Hall performance is something that I would urge everyone to do. Again, this was the national anthem in my uh, heart. I think we were the respect for it would be standing up, but the rendering is so beautiful that it was, uh, it was mesmerizing. Thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna change gears one more. You know, your life with its achievements, both in professional business sense and the artistic well, uh, world are well documented. We have talked about it. One of the things that we do is uh, get people to think about what and when have they experienced failure and what has it taught them? You know, it's a journey. We all learn from things that have not worked well. Is there something that comes to mind where you experienced failure and it changed you, made you something better? Yeah, I mean, I've, you know, like, like everybody, um, you know, I've experienced uh, ups and downs and a lot of failures. And I'll give you a specific example. And that was something that, you know, was sort of my introduction to corporate life in America. And that kind of made me very hard and um, also uh, kind of hardened me up a little bit uh, to make sure that I was able to 
deal with the travails of corporate life. I remember I, you know, freshly graduated out of MIT um, with pretty much straight A's. I remember, and I got this job, my first job. I'm not going to leave the employer or my boss at the time, but it was just a very interesting learning of achievement for, for me. Um, you know, this particular person I was working for, um, you know, had a PhD from Harvard and um, in economics and, um, you know, had a doctorate and was, at the time, he was billing for $1,200 an hour. And I used to do a lot of the analytical work uh, for, for this person. I was an associate. And I did that, I think, pretty good job um, for about a year. And one Friday, he literally walked into my office um, and walked me out you know, basically told me that I wasn't um, good enough, um, which, was, which was quite an awakening for me. Um, and, um, and that happened, I mean, that version of, not exactly that version, but, and essentially, you know, told me not to come, come in from Monday. Um, and that happened a couple of times in my life um, where, you know, I got fired over a text message or I got fired over email because the company wasn't doing well, et cetera. So I think, you know, experiences like that, I mean, those are, you look at those as failures at the time when it happens. And it's happened to the best of us in the United States and it happens all over the world, but especially in the United States. Uh, but then I learned from it because, you know, every opportunity that came, you know, they say that one door closes, you know, five doors open and it's always been better and better. Um, and what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So, you know, that's, for me was a big learning. Um, and I, uh, you know, I'm a big believer in the, in the book, uh, Who Moved My Cheese, where if you have not read the, read the book, book, you should definitely do that. It's a very small 50 or 60 page book, but it's really about, you know, making sure that when you start a new job or any venture, you know, don't get tied to it so much that you take your shoes and tie them and hang it up on the wall. You should really keep it around your neck because anything can happen. And then, you know, you got to keep smelling the cheese. So life is about smelling the cheese and keep moving um, and adopting change. So that was a lesson I learned from the failures. So don't uh, get too accustomed to any set of success or, or yeah. what you think is permanence. Change is the only, only thing that you can count on. That's, that's, right. uh, that's a good lesson to take away. Well, let's end on a fun note. I have a bunch of quick questions for you. Uh, just need your gut reaction. Nothing much to think here. Um, tell us, uh, who would you pick over in Bill Gates or Elon Musk to spend an afternoon? You know, actually both, to be honest, uh, for different reasons. Um, <laughs> Bill Gates, uh, I would say, uh, probably because, you know, he has done two phenomenally uh, very different things, more sort of left brain, right brain in some ways. Um, he started out with Microsoft and then he became one of the largest philanthropists in the world. And there's a huge humanitarian side to it. So I've certainly, yeah. you know, and he likes to read and all that type of stuff. And, you know, we know a yeah. lot about it. So that's sure. certainly, and Elon as well, you know, for different reasons. That's, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll stop it at Bill. That's the one you pick. That's fine. Tell us a movie uh, that uh, you think you could watch 10 times in a row. Wow. Uh, Shawshank Redemption. Uh, love the movie. Love the whole premise. Everything about it. Um, taught me a lot of lessons in life. You know, hope, never give up, dream, dream big. And just be relentless. Um, you know, persistence always beats resistance. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, if you want to delight your child, what kind of gift would you get him? You know, it's funny. I, I, I wanted to say my heart, but <laughs> children, always <laughs> need, children always need actual gifts. Uh, you know, yeah. knowing my kids, uh, it's video games. Uh, nothing quite excites them, uh, unfortunately, more than you know, giving them some money to download some Roblox points or some kind of Minecraft, you know, download yeah. and things like that. So I think that's kind of where, you know, things are, are headed now. But yeah, that's what I would... Uh, what artificial I would. worlds is uh, where yeah. people like to live. Yeah. Last question um, on this. If you were stuck in a foreign city due to a canceled flight, which city would you want to be stuck in and what will you do? 
I would love to be stuck in, it's a small town in, this, in India, in Karnataka called Dharwad. And I would love to be stuck there. I don't even know if they have an airport or not. Um, but it's the seat of Indian classical music and it has some of the best archives, the University of Dharwad of Indian classical music where you can literally go sit there and listen to your heart's delight. And what would I do? I would actually go to the university and the head of the department there is this gentleman, uh, Pandit Venkatesh Kumar, who in my opinion is perhaps the greatest uh, living vocalist of Indian classical music today. And a musician's musician, I would probably just sit at his feet, enjoy music, maybe have a cup of tea and, and talk to him uh, and really, or not even probably just, you know, keep my mouth shut and just listen to him. Um, I think uh, that's what I would do. <laughs> wow, w what a different answer and a different, I don't think I've ever heard that city ever be mentioned. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's a good one. Um, we always end with the question, what is brand Anurag Harsh in your own words? I don't know if I have a brand or so, but you know, I'd like to be a good, you know, good father, uh, you know, a good uh, husband, um, a good son to my mother, um, and really a good citizen um, and somebody who is fun to be around, um, is always smiling, somebody who is, um, is uh, exothermic. That means, you know, I'm giving you energy. So I want to be a person that whoever associates with me uh, gets energy out of me uh, and is able to uh, feel somewhat uplifted. And that's my brand. You know, my brand is about uh, people feeling uplifted by being around me. There you have it, uh, Anurag Harsh, the classically trained singer and leader of artificial intelligence who gets joy from uplifting experience and interactions. Thank you for tuning in. I do want to mention that uh, Dr. JJ Rani also came onto this show. We have a very um, interesting conversation that my colleague did with him and we'll put a link up here if anyone is interested. But uh, thank you so much. This was fascinating, and we're so good to uh, hear your journey. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for listening to The Brand Called You videocast and podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website, www.tbcy.in, to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.